White Fang by Jack London Read by Phil Humphreys Part 2 Born of the Wild Chapter 1 The Battle of Fangs It was the she-wolf who had first caught the sound of men's voices and the whining of the sled dogs. And it was the she-wolf who was first to spring away from the cornered man in his circle of dying flame. The pack had been loath to forego the kill it had hunted down, and it lingered for several minutes, making sure of the sounds, and then it too sprang away from the trail made by the she-wolf. Running at the forefront of the pack was a large grey wolf, one of its several leaders. It was he who directed the pack's course on the heels of the she-wolf. It was he who snarled warningly at the younger members of the pack, or slashed at them with his fangs, and they ambitiously tried to pass him. And it was he who increased the pace when he sighted the she-wolf, now trotting slowly across the snow. She dropped in alongside him, as though it were her appointed position, and took the pace of the pack. It did not snarl at her, nor show his teeth when any leap of hers chanced to put her in advance of him. On the contrary, he seemed kindly disposed toward her, too kindly to suit her, for he was prone to run near to her, and when he ran too near, it was she who snarled and showed her teeth. Nor was she above slashing his shoulder sharply on occasion. At such times he betrayed no anger, he merely sprang to the side and ran stiffly ahead for several awkward leaps, in carriage and conduct resembling an abashed country swain. This was his one trouble in the running of the pack, but she had other troubles. On her other side ran a gaunt old wolf, grizzled and marked with the scars of many battles. He always ran on her right side fact that he had but one eye, and that the left eye, might account for this. He also was addicted to crowding her, to veering toward her till his scarred muzzle touched her body or shoulder or neck. As with the running mate on her left, she repelled these attentions with her teeth. But when both bestowed their attentions at the same time, she was roughly jostled, being compelled with quick snaps to either side to drive both lovers away at the same time to maintain her forward leap with the pack and to see the way of her feet before her. At such times her running mates flashed their teeth and growled threateningly across at each other. They might have fought, but even wooing and its rivalry waited upon the more pressing hunger need of the pack. After each repulse, and the old wolf sheered abruptly away from the sharp-toothed object of his desire. He shouldered against a young three-year-old that ran on his blind right side. This young wolf had attained his full size, and considering the weak and famished condition of the pack, he possessed more than the average vigour and spirit. Nevertheless, he ran with his head, even with the shoulder of his one-eyed elder. When he ventured to run abreast of the older wolf, which was seldom, a snarl and a snap sent him back, even with the shoulder again. Sometimes, however, he dropped cautiously and slowly behind, and edged in between the old leader and the she-wolf. This was doubly resented, even triply resented. When she snarled her displeasure, the old leader would whirl on the three-year-old. Sometimes she whirled on him, too and sometimes the young leader on the left whirled as well. At such times, confronted by three sets of savage teeth, the young wolf stopped precipitately, throwing himself back on his haunches, with his forelegs stiff, mouth menacing and mane bristling. This confusion in the front of the moving pack always caused confusion in the rear. The wolves behind collided with the young wolf, and expressed their displeasure by administering sharp nips on his hind legs and flanks. He was laying up trouble for himself, for lack of food and short tempers went together, but with the boundless faith of youth he persisted in repeating the manoeuvre every little while, though it never succeeded in gaining anything for him but discomfiture. 
Had there been food, love making and fighting would have gone on apace, and the pack formation would have been broken up. But the situation of the pack was desperate. It was lean with long standing hunger. It ran below its ordinary speed. At the rear limped the weak members, the very young and the very old. At the front were the strongest, yet all were more like skeletons than full bodied wolves. Nevertheless, with the exception of the ones that limped, the movements of the animals were effortless and tireless. Their stringy muscles seemed founts of inexhaustible energy. Behind every steel-like contraction of a muscle lay another steel-like contraction, and another, and another, apparently without end. They ran many miles that day. They ran through the night, and the next day found them still running. They were running over the surface of a world frozen and dead. No life stirred. They alone moved through the vast inertness. They alone were alive, and they sought for other things that were alive in order that they might devour them and continue to live. They crossed low divides and ranged a dozen small streams in a lower lying country before their quest was rewarded. Then they came upon Moose. It was a big bull they first found. Here was meat and life. It was guarded by no mysterious fires nor flying missiles of flame. Splay hooves and palmated antlers they knew, and they flung their customary patience and caution to the wind. It was a brief fight and fierce. The big bull was beset on every side. He ripped them open or split their skulls with shrewdly driven blows of his great hooves. He crushed them and broke them on his large horns. He stamped them into the snow under him in the wallowing struggle. But he was foredoomed, and he went down with the she-wolf tearing savagely at his throat, and with other teeth fixed everywhere upon him, devouring him alive, before ever his last struggle ceased, or his last damage had been wrought. There was food in plenty. The bull weighed over eight hundred pounds, fully twenty pounds of meat per mouth for the forty-odd wolves of the pack. And if they could fast prodigiously, they could feed prodigiously. And soon a few scattered bones were all that remained of the splendid live brute that had faced the pack a few hours before. There was now much resting and sleeping. With full stomachs, bickering and quarrelling began among the younger males, and this continued through the next few days that followed before the breaking up of the pack. The famine was over. The wolves were now in the country of game, and though they still hunted in pack, they hunted more cautiously, cutting out heavy cows or crippled old bulls from the small moose herds they ran across. There came a day in this land of plenty when the wolf pack split in half and went in different directions. The she-wolf, the younger leader on her left, and the one-eyed elder on her right, led their half of the pack down to the Mackenzie River and across into the lake country to the east. Each day this remnant of the pack dwindled, two by two, male and female. The wolves were deserting. Occasionally a solitary male was driven out by the sharp teeth of his rivals. In the end there remained only four. The she-wolf, the young leader, the one-eyed one, and the ambitious three-year-old. The she-wolf had by now developed a ferocious temper. Her three suitors all bore the marks of her teeth, yet they never replied in kind, never defended themselves against her. They turned their shoulders to her most savage slashes, and with wagging tails and mincing steps strove to placate her wrath. But if they were all mildness toward her, they were all fierceness toward each other. The three-year-old grew too ambitious in his fierceness. He caught the one-eyed elder on his blind side and ripped his ear to ribbons. Though the grizzled old fellow could only see on one side against the youth and vigour of the other, he brought into play the wisdom of long years of experience. 
his lost eye and his scarred muzzle bore evidence to the nature of his experience. He had survived too many battles to be in doubt for a moment about what to do. The battle began fairly, but it did not end fairly. There was no telling what the outcome would have been, for the third wolf joined the elder, and together the old leader and the young leader, they attacked the ambitious three-year-old and proceeded to destroy him. He was beset on either side by the merciless fangs of his erstwhile comrades. Forgotten were the days they had hunted together, the game they had pulled down, the famine they had suffered. That business was a thing of the past. The business of love was at hand, ever a sterner and crueler business than that of food-getting. And in the meanwhile, the she-wolf, the cause of it all, sat down contentedly on her haunches and watched. She was even pleased. This was hair day. And it came not often, when manes bristles and fangs smote fang, or ripped and tore the yielding flesh, all for the possession of her. And in the business of love, the three-year-old, who had made this his first adventure upon it, yielded up his life. On either side of his body stood his two rivals. They were gazing at the she-wolf, who sat smiling in the snow. But the elder leader was wise, very wise, in love even as in battle. The younger leader turned his head to lick a wound on his shoulder. The curve of his neck was turned toward his rival. With his one eye, the elder saw the opportunity. He darted in, low, and closed with his fangs. It was a long, ripping slash, and deep as well. His teeth, in passing, burst the wall of the great vein of the throat, and then he leapt clear. The young leader snarled terribly, but his snarl broke midmost into a tickling cough. Bleeding and coughing, already stricken, he sprang at the elder and fought while life faded from him, his legs going weak beneath him, the light of day dulling on his eyes, his blows and springs falling shorter and shorter. And all the while, the she-wolf sat on her haunches and smiled. She was made glad in vague ways by the battle, for this was the love-making of the wild the sex tragedy of the natural world that was tragedy only to those that died. To those that survived, it was not tragedy, but realisation and achievement. When the young leader lay in the snow and moved no more, one eye stalked over to the she-wolf. His carriage was one of mingled triumph and caution. He was plainly expectant of a rebuff, and he was just as plainly surprised when her teeth did not flash out at him in anger. For the first time she met him with a kindly manner. She sniffed noses with him, and even condescended to leap about and frisk and play with him in quite a puppyish fashion. And he, for all his grey years and sage experience, behaved quite as puppyishly, even a little more foolishly. Forgotten already, were the vanquished rivals, and the love tale red written on the snow. Forgotten save once, when old One-Eye stopped for a moment to lick his stiffening wounds. Then it was that his lips half writhed into a snarl, and the hair of his neck and shoulders involuntarily bristled, while he half crouched for a spring, his claws spasmodically clutching into the snow surface for a firmer footing. But it was all forgotten the next moment, as he sprang after the she-wolf, who was coyly leading him a chase through the woods. After that they ran side by side, like good friends who have come to an understanding. The days passed by and they kept together, hunting their meat and killing and eating it in common. After a time, the she-wolf began to grow restless. She seemed to be searching for something that she could not find. The hollows under fallen trees seemed to attract her, and she spent much time nosing about among the 
larger snow-piled crevices in the rocks and in the caves of overhanging banks. Old One-Eye was not interested at all, but he followed her good-naturedly in her quest, and when her investigations in particular places were unusually protracted, he would lie down and wait until she was ready to go. He did not remain in one place, but travelled across country until they gained the Mackenzie River, down which they slowly went, leaving it often to hunt game among the small streams that entered it, but always returning to it again. Sometimes they chanced upon other wolves, usually in pairs, but there was no friendliness of intercourse displayed on either side, no gladness at meeting, no desire to return to the pack formation. Several times they encountered solitary wolves. These were always males, and they were pressingly insistent on joining with one eye and his mate. This he resented, and when she stood shoulder to shoulder with him, bristling and showing her teeth, the aspiring solitary ones would back off, turn tail, and continue on their lonely way. One moonlight night, running through the quiet forest, one eye suddenly halted. His muzzle went up and his tail stiffened, and his nostrils dilated as he scented the air. One foot also he held up after the manner of a dog. He was not satisfied, and he continued to smell the air, striving to understand the message borne upon it to him. One careless sniff had satisfied his mate, and she trotted on to reassure him. Though he followed her, he was still dubious, and he could not forbear an occasional halt in order to more carefully study the warning. She crept out cautiously on the edge of a large open space in the midst of the trees. For some time she stood alone, then one eye creeping and crawling, every sense on the alert, every hair radiating infinite suspicion, joined her. They stood side by side, watching and listening and smelling. To their ears came the sounds of dogs wrangling and scuffling, the guttural cries of men, the sharper voices of scolding women, and once the shrill and plaintive cry of a child. With the exception of the huge bulks of the skin lodges, little could be seen save the flames of the fire, broken by the movements of intervening bodies, and the smoke rising slowly on the quiet air. But to their nostrils came the myriad smells of an Indian camp, carrying a story that was largely incomprehensible to one eye, but every detail of which the she-wolf knew. She was strangely stirred, and sniffed and sniffed with an increasing delight. But old One-Eye was doubtful. He betrayed his apprehension, and started tentatively to go. She turned and touched his neck with her muzzle in a reassuring way, then regarded the camp again. A new wistfulness was in her face, but it was not the wistfulness of hunger. She was thrilling to a desire that urged her to go forward, to be in closer to that fire, to be squabbling with the dogs, and to be avoiding and dodging the stumbling feet of men. One eye moved impatiently beside her. Her unrest came back upon her, and she knew again her pressing need to find the thing for which she searched. She turned and trotted back into the forest, to the great relief of one eye, who trotted a little to the fore until they were well within the shelter of the trees. They slid along, noiseless as shadows in the moonlight. They came upon a runaway. Both noses went down to the footprints in the snow. These footprints were very fresh. One eye ran ahead cautiously, his mate at his heels. The broad pads of their feet were spread wide, and in contact with the snow were like velvet. One eye caught sight of a dim movement of white in amidst the white. The sliding gait had been deceptively swift, but it was as nothing to the speed at which he now ran. Before him was bounding the faint patch of white he had discovered. They were running along a narrow alley flanked on either side by a growth of young spruce. Through the trees the mouth of the alley could be seen, opening out on a moonlit glade. Old One-Eye was rapidly overhauling the 
the fleeing shape of white. Bound by bound he gained. Now he was upon it. One leap more and his teeth would be sinking into it. But that leap was never made. High in the air and straight up soared the shape of white. Now a struggling snowshoe rabbit that leapt and bounded, executing a fantastic dance there above him in the air, never once returning to earth. One eye sprang back with a snort of sudden fright, then shrank down to the snow and crouched, snarling threats at this thing of fear he did not understand. But the she-wolf coolly thrust past him. She poised for a moment, then sprang for the dancing rabbit. She too soared high, but not so high as the quarry, and her teeth clipped emptily together with a metallic snap. She made another leap, and another. Her mate had slowly relaxed from his crouch and was watching her. He now evinced displeasure at her repeated failures, and himself made a mighty spring upward. His teeth closed upon the rabbit, and he bore it back to earth with him. But at the same time there was a suspicious crackling movement beside him, and his astonished eye saw a young spruce sapling bending down above him to strike him. His jaws let go their grip, and he leapt backward to escape this strange danger, his lips drawn back from his fangs, his throat snarling, every hair bristling with rage and fright. And in that moment the sapling reared its slender length upright, and the rabbit soared, dancing in the air again. The she-wolf was angry. She sank her fangs into her mate's shoulder in reproof, and he, frightened, unaware of what constituted this new onslaught, struck back ferociously, and in still greater fright, ripping down the side of the she-wolf's muzzle. For him to resent such reproof was equally unexpected to her, and she sprang upon him in snarling indignation. Then he discovered his mistake, and tried to placate her, but she proceeded to punish him roundly, until he gave over all attempts at placation, and whirled in a circle, his head away from her, his shoulders receiving the punishment of her teeth. In the meantime, the rabbit danced above them in the air, the she-wolf sat down in the snow, and old One-Eye, now more in fear of his mate than of the mysterious sapling, again sprang for the rabbit. As he sank back with it between his teeth, he kept his eye on the sapling. As before, it followed him back to earth. He crouched down under the impending blow, his hair bristling, but his teeth still keeping tight hold of the rabbit. But the blow did not fall. The sapling remained bent above him. When he moved, it moved. He growled at it through his clenched jaws. When he remained still, it remained still. And he concluded it was safer to continue remaining still. Yet the warm blood of the rabbit tasted good in his mouth. It was his mate who relieved him from the quandary in which he found himself. She took the rabbit from him, and while the sapling swayed and teetered threateningly above her, she calmly gnawed off the rabbit's head. At once the sapling shot up, and after that gave no more trouble, remaining in the decorous and perpendicular position in which nature had intended it to grow. Then between them the she-wolf and one-eye devoured the game which the mysterious sapling had caught for them. There were other runways and alleys where rabbits were hanging in the air, and the wolf pair prospected them all, the she-wolf leading the way, old one-eye following and observant, learning the method of robbing snares, a knowledge destined to stand him in good stead in the days to come.